tomorrow at about 115 to 4, 430, something like that. Additional hours tomorrow if you need to come in. All right. Pass that along, please. All right, today is uh, kind of wrapping up the central limit theorem. I'm going to do a couple examples. Then I'll hand out a worksheet. I have uh, one or two bonus problems. What I often do uh, with worksheets while you're working on those, some of you tend to get done faster than the others. That's, that's fine. But if you get done faster, you're still going to do statistics on the bonus problem, either on the up here displayed or on a handout. And if you correctly get the bonus problem, then you earn points for everyone on the next quiz. Oh, I got your attention there. So the eyes wandering around all of a sudden. The points are for the whole class. All right, a little bit of review. Central limit theorem. In Ed Wicks, what are some of the remarkable, amazing things about the central limit theorem that just got you so excited and enthused about that? Like, even if you have a uh, uniform distribution, you can take a certain amount of standard samples and get a mean of them, you still get a filter. Well done. It doesn't matter where I start out, the distribution I'm sampling from, my sampling distribution of the sample means, you have to put all those words together, approaches a normal distribution. And if you're calling that a Java applet, I you start out with uniform, it looked like a box, shoe box, we had skewed, we had bimodal. We always end up with, or we approach, a normal distribution. What's another really amazing, wonderful thing that the central limit theorem tells us? That the mean of the sample means is equal to the original mean? The mean of the sample means is equal to the mean of the, uh, the population, right, which we had hoped, that makes sense. And along that lines, I'll write that up here, how we say that. What other amazing thing? We say mu of x bar is equal to mu. Uh, what else do we know? Go ahead, Van, um, Van Zandt, yes. Isn't it, uh, Standard is standard deviation. Okay, that would be sigma. Sigma, sorry. Um, is equal to, yes. Is that right? Uh, no, it goes over the square root of the square. sample. Square root, okay. Now, why is that good news? Roscoe? Because the larger the sample, the smaller the, um, the, uh, Standard deviation. Standard deviation of the sample means. True, and that's good because the points are, are um, there's less outliers. Fewer outliers, so there's less variation, spread, dispersion. The bottom line means I'll be able to get more accurate estimates because it's very unlikely as my standard deviation gets smaller, right? my x bars will tend to be closer to the true mean because there's less variance. And I, I would much rather have be working with a, a population with a small standard deviation if I'm trying to do estimates because I can get closer estimates, more accurate. <clears throat> All right. Now, when can I use the central limit there? I'm not sure if I went over this slide or not. I think I talked about it. This is important stuff, hint, hint, all right? These are just the kind of questions that often appear in, appear in multiple choice questions. And that's because they're really important. When do I use, or when am I, when can I safely use the results of the central limit theorem? Well, if the population is not normal, or if you don't know the distribution of the population you're sampling from, then you want to make sure your sample size n is greater than 30. And that's a good rule of thumb. That's not a, there's no mathematical proof that says it's exactly 30. That's just practical experience over hundreds of years. 
except for the most pathological distributions, a sample size 30 gets you close to a normal distribution. The distribution of the sample means will be close to normal distribution. So when you use the normal distribution to calculate probabilities, you won't be off by much. If the population is not normal, or if the population is normal, excuse me, if you have reason to believe it's normal, or you're told you can assume it's normal, then the sample size really doesn't matter. It's a pretty simple exercise to prove. If we had the calculus that the distribution of the sample means is always normal if the population you're sampling from is normal. So these two rules, either n greater than 30 if I know nothing about the distribution of the ones from which I'm sampling, or if I know it's not normal, I gotta have n greater than 30, but if it is normal, then any, any sample size will do. And kind of the converse of that is, if you're sampling from a distribution that's not normal, and n is less than 30, stop. Don't use these techniques. Because you haven't approached close enough to a normal distribution, and you can't guarantee the results you're gonna get will be accurate. All right? So keep that in mind, important stuff. All right, let's talk about Coke cans. Let's do a problem here. Chairman Coca-Cola called me and wanted some statistical consultants. So I said, I'll take this to my class, my 106 class. Coke maintains that their cans are filled with 12 ounces. And the chairman wanted me to say, do an experiment, and to verify that that's true. That on average, there's 12 ounces of Coke in a can. So we took a sample size of uh, 36, and I calculated a sample mean that was 12.19 ounces. <coughs> now, we're going to make two assumptions here to make it easier to solve this problem. We're going to assume sigma is 0.11. And sigma is what sigma? Which standard deviation? Population standard deviation. So I'm pretending a little bit here. I'm pretending I know the true population standard deviation of the amount of coke, the amount, number of ounces of the coke can. All right. And now the question is, with this data, what do we tell the chairman of Coca-Cola? That there is more than they are actually going to How do you know that? Because the sample size was larger. You mean? Yes? Yes. And because even with a standard deviation, even if it was a full um, standard deviation, close to the 12, then it's still above 12, so you'd have to look more than the full standard deviation. So it's a long So it's more likely that it would be like 12, 19, maybe a little higher than the Good job of using statistical reasoning. And we're going to be more precise here in just a minute. But here's the, here's the kind of reasoning we're going to introduce today, and we'll be using this in chapters 7 through 11. All right? We have a sample. And the sample says it was 12.19. So let's start putting some labels to these numbers. What label would I put to 12.19? What, what is that? Here. Yeah. What is it? It's the Yeah, it's the next part. What's 12? 12 ounces. Population. 
Yeah, that, that's really a claim, isn't it? Uh, point one one. That's a sigma. And what other number is there that's important? N equals size. N equals 36. Now, to answer the question posed by the chairman code, we want to answer this prob equivalent probability question. If Coke cans really are, on average, population mean really is 12 ounces, how likely is it that I would randomly select 36 cans and have their mean weight, their mean number of ounces to be 12.19? Follow that reasoning? It starts out with an assumption. 12 ounces in a can, that's the mean. Then we have a piece of information. All right, I took 36, random, I got that sample mean. If this is an unusual result, then it's not likely I'm going to believe that. But if it's not an unusual result, then I report back, well, I don't think there really are 12 ounces on a can on average. So how would we come up with a firm number for the chairman on exactly that probability? What am I studying? I'm studying X bar, the mean weight, no, not weight, the mean number of ounces in 36 cans. And view of X bar, central limit theorem, well, can I use the central limit theorem? Why? You know, greater than 30. Greater than 30. It would be pretty reasonable to believe that the number of ounces in the Coke cans are normally distributed, but I don't even have to make that leap of faith. I've got 36, and it's greater than 30. So I can't go ahead and use the central limit there. Mu of x bar is equal to mu, which is equal to 12. Sigma x bar is sigma over the square root of n. I need to have your calculators fired up and ready here. So that is 0.11 divided by the square root of 36. 0 0.018. 0 0.018? Yes, sir. Now help me draw the graph that corresponds to the question I posed. How would I draw in a shaded area here that corresponds to this problem? What am I looking for? Uh, from 12 on. 12 on? Not quite. 12 on. Well, I have 12.19. That's my sample statistic. And I would like to know how likely is it that I would get a sample of 36 Coke cans that had a mean number of ounces of 12.19? Is that unusual or would I expect it? Or is it relatively rare? Do you agree that that shaded area is a probability that would represent the probability of getting 36 Coke cans mean number of ounces of 12.19, assuming that the mean for a single can is 12 and the standard deviation for a single can is 0.01. Agreed? Well, then if you agree that this is easy, what's that probability? It's normal CDF, left, right, mu sigma. So start putting these in. 12.19, I use 0.018, or no, oh, sorry, sorry, E99, mu is 12, and sigma is 0 0.018. And what number do you get? 4.2%. 4.2%. 4.2%. 
four point two. Yeah. Check that again. Twelve point one nine E ninety nine. Twelve point zero one eight. Uh, point one four five. Say that again. Point one four five. <coughs> Too high. How long did you? Uh, the the two point four four. <coughs> yeah, there's an e to the minus something by there, right? Don't forget that. It's go ahead and say it, two point four e to the negative point six. Remember on your on your calculators when you see the result of the normal CDF, that's a probability, so it has to be less than one. And I, I see this every semester. So don't be one of the cadets that make this mistake. They'll see a 2.4 and just write that down. That can't be right. You tell me the probability is 2.4? No, not gonna happen. You need to read all the way to the right. 2.4 e to the minus 26. That's a number out of the calculator. That's a probability. What does that number mean? I'm going to be asking this question a lot this semester. I know you can use calculators. Can you tell me what the number means? Yes. It's unusual. What is unusual? Uh, probability of getting some. Yeah. Go ahead. You're on the right trail. It's unlikely. Yeah, it's not unusual. It's unlikely. It's, it's unlikely, it's rare, it's going to happen. I don't know what that number is, but that's a tiny number. All right. But let's complete this. Now, you're briefing the chairman of Coca Cola. What are you going to, how are you going to summarize your result in one sentence? Or use a couple sentences. How would you explain this number? Galvez? Yeah, Let me take you through this. I'm going to be doing this a lot. You'll see that I'm pretty fussy about this statistics. I'm not going to, I will sell and just accept the number out of the calculator as the answer. I want a sentence or an explanation of what it means. That's a probability. That's a really, really small probability. You might as well say zero for all practical purposes. It's saying if there really was, on average, or if the mean number of ounces of cocaine really was 12, then the probability of us getting a sample of 36 with a mean of 12.19 is practically zero. It would never happen. So your interpretation or your conclusion is, well, you could conclude one of two things, couldn't you? You could conclude Man, did I get an unusual set of 36 cans. Right? Maybe once or twice since the universe was created, I would actually get 36 cans that had 12.19 ounces in it. Could happen. What's another far more likely conclusion? Well, you go back to your assumptions. What did I assume? What did that was? U equals 12. So you would have to say to the chairman, the evidence suggests that there are more than 12 ounces in the can of coke. You follow that? It's subtle right now, but we're going to be doing that throughout the semester, folks. So kind of wrap your mind around it, reasoning statistically. Okay. Let's do another problem demonstrate the power of the central limit theorem. I want you to read that. Most of this course, the problems are going to start out with a paragraph. And the skill I want you to start practicing now is read the paragraph. Every number there has to have a symbol that means something. Read the paragraph carefully, and then we're going to translate those numbers into the correct statistical symbols.
So we begin by, we're sampling uh, power supplies and we're told they're uniformly distributed between 115 and 125 volts. Now why is that piece of information <coughs> useful to me in this context? It's uniform, not, not normal. It's not normal, all right. Since I'm sampling from a distribution that's not normal, what should I be looking for later in the problem? The area. Sample size. If I'm sampling from something that's not normal, I better have a sample size greater than 30 or I can't use the techniques. Uh, sample of 50. If I take a sample of 50, can I use the central limit there? All right, great, we're good to go. Now, <coughs> you're gonna be given a, f a little bit uh, additional information here. For a uniform distribution, I'm telling you that the mean and the standard deviation are given by those formulas. I wouldn't expect you to know those, but you're given that. And B and A, well in this case, 115 is A, and 125 is B. And we want to know the probability, if I take 40 of those power supplies and calculate the mean voltage, what's the probability that it would be greater than 122? How can I do that? Hmm. So what variable am I studying? I'm studying an X bar. And my X bar is 122. That's the, the number in question. What other information do I have up there that I can assign a letter or a symbol to? N equals 50. N equals 50. All right, what else am I gonna to need to know here? Yeah, B and A. Well, a you got B's 125, so A is 115. When I work these kind of problems, I need to know a couple other things. Where you find your mean? I need a mu. What is mu? Uh, that would be 1.5 plus 115 divided by 2. Here's my formula for mu. And that's going to be 20. I need a sigma. Where's my sigma? It's going to be 125 minus 115. Square okay. Someone tell me what that number is. Let's stop and think about our situation. My distribution of, of my random variable x. What I'm sampling from is no, it's uniform between 1 115 and 125. So this is what my distribution of x's look like if I looked at one power supply at a time. But I'm not looking at one power supply at a time, am I? I'm looking at x bar, which is the mean of uh, 50. I can use the central limit theorem. So what are the next two pieces of information I can derive given what I know already? Things that I'm going to need to calculate a probability. Roscoe? Mu of x bar. I need a mu of x bar because that's what I'm studying over here. All right? Well, mu of x bar is equal to mu, which is equal to 120. I'll need a sigma x bar, which is sigma over the square root of n. Sigma is 2.88. Square root of n is the square root of 50. All right, someone tell me what that is. 2.88 over the square root of 50. Point 
407. And the shaded area represents the probability that X bar would be greater than or equal to 122. X bar is the mean of 50 power supplies, the mean up. And I know how to calculate that. That's normal CDF. Get your fingers moving here. Normal CDF, left, right, mu, sigma. But remember, it's mu of X bar and sigma X bar that we're using. What's that probability? Okay. Uh, 4.4 times 10 to the negative 7. 4.4 e minus 7. I guess I don't have that written down. So the rest you got? So I did that example. Okay, it works. Stay with us. So I'm going to get better. I provided this example explicitly so you'd see I can start out with a distribution that's not normal, a uniform distribution. Uniform distribution was my sample, what I'm sampling from. Since I, my sample size was greater than 30, it was 50 in this case, I still can use a central limit theorem. And I can calculate the probability of those 50 power supplies having a mean output of greater than 122, and that's the probability. All right? Good. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand out a worksheet right now that you can practice this skill on. And I will also put up on the display here a bonus problem. If you're done early, work on that. We'll work on these for maybe 10, 15 minutes, and then we'll see if anyone has the bonus problem solved. All right?